You are listening to the Running Channel podcast live. <laughs> that, that worked really well. Honestly, in rehearsals, that was awful. So. <laughs> time, what re- 101. Nailed it. <laughs> what, what rehearsals? This is one oh, yeah, take, is, as yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> live from the Strand in London ahead of the London Marathon. This is pretty nuts. This yeah. is like pinch me moment, isn't it? Yeah, London Marathon's tomorrow. I can't quite believe that we've got this space or that we've got all of these lovely people right in front of us, which or is a little bit scary as well. Or that we've signed you up to run it. No, hang on, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, but imagine. <laughs> yes. He would never, ever run a marathon. <laughs> oh yeah, but if you haven't listened to this before, then I'm Andy. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rick. And that's about as far as we've got in terms of planning this podcast. <laughs> yeah, which, which is quite far, actually. Yeah, 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 that's actually pretty good for us. So today, because we're live in front of an audience, we thought we'd let them lead what we're going to do and ask loads of questions. But I guess let's start off just by talking about London and how exciting it is. It's very exciting to be here. I um, never thought that we'd have the opportunity to meet the audience. We had two years where you, you, know, you couldn't even go out into the world. Um, and now we've got people who are telling us that they've seen our videos, that they like the podcast, hopefully. Um, they might be let down today. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, we get a chance to, to kind of answer the questions directly and do that from this amazing location directly opposite the Savoy. We're like a few meters from the course and a few hundred meters from the finish. So really exciting. And also show the fact that the running channel now looks a little bit different. We're in our nice merch. Yeah. I didn't get the memo about no. matching the t-shirts behind. So sorry. But oh, yeah. otherwise we wouldn't have seen the blue one. Yeah, but blue's more your color there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so being the arbiter of fashion. Yeah. Video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, if anyone listens to this podcast often, they'll know that my fashion taste excels, you know, <laughs> compared to most people on the channel. Well, there's, a re- a... there's a reason you put me in orange. Yeah, well, at least your fashion your, your fashion taste excels, but you're the one that's going to be keeping us on track here, because oh, we yeah, need to have sorry. a spot to go to the music, so all let's right, do that now. Right. Pause. Welcome back! <laughs> <laughs> So normally on the Running Channel podcast, we take one big topic in running and talk about it. Then we'll talk about the news and then we'll talk about the questions from the audience. But it's the questions from the people in front of us today that we're going to lead with for most of today. But first, we should have a little bit of a catch up. Sarah, we just got back from Boston. Yes, we have. My legs have almost recovered from running a full marathon. I was telling people, I I think you're either a person whose legs do well on a plane or who don't do well on a plane. And mine don't. Really, really, really don't. Yeah, one of your legs was a dramatically different size. (laughs) (laughs) We were waiting. Our bags were so delayed at baggage claim. (laughs) And I think you came back from the toilet and I was like, Andy, look at my ankles. (laughs) I was like, I can't see your ankles anymore. (laughs) It's just all one leg. There's no differentiation. But I tell you what, I've worn compression socks on and off for the last two days. Have they sorted out? And I can almost see my ankle again. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they actually winner. work, those compression socks? Yeah, they're really, really, really? good. Yeah. I think you're just a bit late wearing them since you... Well, yeah, so when I went to Japan, I wore them on the plane. Yeah. Very clever, worked a dream. Then yeah, I got yeah. onto the plane in Boston and was like, I knew I forgot something. Yeah, I used to wear <laughs> compression leggings to fly long, long haul. It's particularly pre and post race. And maybe it was just psychological, but I think it helped. But actually, Boston-wise, I want to call you on something else. Um, you're, we, anyone regular listeners of the podcast will know that we talk about Strava titles a little bit. Um, <laughs> Sarah ran... Oh, I knew this is going to come Yeah, out. yeah. Um, Sarah ran uh, Boston Marathon the day before the, the, the marathon. And what did you call the Strava activity of 43 kilometres it was in the end? For the last five days, it's been called Afternoon Run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, we've, we've been really busy. Although I did, I did update it yesterday. I think I just... I, I, because we've talked about it, yeah. I was like, I had writer's block. I didn't honestly didn't know what to name it. So you so. had the paranoia. Did you call it afternoon run with Andy? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, afternoon run in, in Boston with some other people, <laughs> but also by myself. Yeah, smooth. With smooth. emoji. With, with oh, emoji. yes. I've been called out for putting an emoji in my, uh, in my Strava title. Well, let's just get a little hands up here. If you put an emoji in a sentence, let's say like afternoon lion in bed would you put bed and then an emoji of a bed or would you just put an emoji of a bed hands up for just an emoji of a bed yes oh no yes, yes. yes. Not. I, that, I, that, did, I, I did about 30 percent so yeah about 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 70 percent therefore on my side, my side. <laughs> <laughs> so so i mean actually we didn't give them the option of who just wouldn't put an emoji at all oh, but, yeah, who wouldn't put an emoji Okay. Wow. About, about, I'm, I'm feeling. I'm feeling. About, about I'm feeling twenty-four point five percent. That was more than the last one. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, Rick clearly can't see or do maths. No. So. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. Anyway. Yeah. We. Uh, we should. We should move on from that probably. Yeah. How. How's your week been? Busy. We've been putting this together. It's been. 
brand taken flat out that, that this being the space that we're in now, mile 27 on the strand for the running channel. Um, really proud of the team and where we've got to and of the fact that this week we've put this thing out into the world, which is the, the rebrand. So new logos and so on. I know we talked about it on last week's podcast yeah. by the time this comes out, so we shouldn't dwell on it too much, but there might be some people have questions about it. So then we can answer anyone's questions that they've got about why we look a little bit different or where we came from in the first place and, and things like that. Do you know, it's been really nice since we've been here. People have just kind of popped in from all over the place. We had a question on the podcast a few weeks ago from Brazil. And the guy who asked the question from Brazil just came into the shop, which is pretty nuts. I mean, That's he, a flex, he is claimed it? to be the guy <laughs> from Brazil. No, his question was about but, running London, wasn't it? But he said he wasn't running. But saying that, oh, you were supposed maybe, to be running London I and know. you're not running London. <laughs> I know. So yeah. yeah, I originally did have a place for London, but I think just, I I would just injure myself. I think some sometimes you want to get swept up in the moment and just enjoy it and run it. And I definitely probably could cover the whole thing yeah. tomorrow, but I also want to then be able to run yeah. for the rest of this year. And, yeah. and <laughs> I think lots of people do train and they can run back-to-back -back marathons, but I'm just not there yet. Yeah, the well, difficulty yeah. is we, we get a lot of cool opportunities at the Running Channel, obviously, and we can't say yes to all of them. I'm and trying. But yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and quite often it's me saying, Sarah, can you do this absolutely crazy thing on the other side of the yeah, world? Yes, Sarah, can you run Boston by yeah. yourself? Yeah. Honestly, guys, <laughs> Which was 100% yeah. your idea. Yeah, it was my idea. You know what? I mean, it, it is a... Oh, 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 no. Oh. Did they have a question? Oh. Did they have a question? <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Cancel that question. So Cancel. that's just, uh, it's like we um, it's like we deliberately ask someone's their phone to go off just to make it, make sure people could hear that we were live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not only nice to do this in front of an audience on, you know, London Marathon Weekend, but also it's nice to be here on a panel with people who've run marathons in Britain. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> well, before, I mean, I haven't run a marathon at all before you I just stopped talking at this point, yeah, Andy. Yeah, you haven't yeah. got a leg to stand on. <laughs> anyway, right, I'll go come on. to the rest of today's pod. Okay, <laughs> go on then. Go on then, Rick. Let's, before we go to questions, let's dive back to 2017. I'm not as old as Andy. 2017, you were in your prime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us about your... Do you know what? I, I mean... You're still in your prime, mate, right? Still, still in the prime. But people always, you know, talk about London. I just think London is such a fantastic place to do a marathon. The support in London, people say it every year. It's mind blowing. And if there's one tip I always go, whatever marathon, don't carry too much, but especially not in London. Because I ended up, when I did it, I carried so much stuff with me. I had a massive pair of cans, I had bags <laughs> of sweets, Harry Bow. I had like, you know, like a, basically a, a, a belt that could carry grenades worth of uh, gels. Do you know why uh, though? Because the running channel didn't exist for the amazing advice that you would have had in advice of, in that, advance of the marathon. That's true, that's yeah. true. So if, if, I, if I want it for anyone like doing a marathon, it's just don't carry much. If I do a marathon again, I'd basically just wear my vest and a pair of short shorts. I wouldn't even take a phone. We don't shoes? want to see... We'd... Shoes, shoes, <laughs> yes. Also, also no one wants to see you in those short shorts. Again. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think, I think you need to just practice what you're going to run the marathon in. Practice what you practice. Yeah. My yeah, vast yeah. marathon experience. But you need, you need to... Um, practice all of the stuff you're going to carry with you so that it's, there's no chafing, so that you've got all of the stuff for fueling, so that mm. you're kind of nothing you're on race day. And the weather looks so good as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's lots of people worried about the rain. Yeah, that is that is a problem. Hey, look, there is no such thing as bad weather, just poor clothing. That's so. true. You know, if, if, if you were going to pick dream marathon weather, actually, I was thinking about this, you'd probably go grey, no wind, 14 degrees. Yeah. Which is probably Maybe even what you'd cooler. get in London, you know, that could be London any day of the year. <laughs> yeah, I feel like London But actually Marathon's... this year, <laughs> not so good. Yeah, it's gonna well, rain. It is, I mean, it will be gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About 10 to 14 See, degrees. Yeah, just, just, just soggy. Just Maybe, very just soggy. soggy. Maybe. Fact, because this is going out next Saturday, you might still be wet from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a show Newspaper, of hands. Newspaper, those shoes. Yeah, maybe a show of hands for who would rather it's hot and who would rather it's raining. So for hot, oh, you at the back there, we've got That's three. A Go on, Rick, uh, what percent's then, uh, that? Uh, 7.2. <laughs> and, and then raining? Raining, I guess, is the rest, right? I mean, no one would, no one would like the rain. Interesting. Yeah. Also, the wonderful thing about running such a big marathon is that if you put yourself in the middle of the crowds at the start, then the penguin method just sorts you right out. The what? The What's that? Did you not use the penguin huddle at school? Oh, for warmth. For warmth, yeah. What oh school did you God. go to? <laughs> <laughs> penguin Academy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just needed friends. So then Rick, Rick, Rick was my only friend. It's not much of a huddle, is it? Yeah, yeah. He was three years older than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, for any, I mean, that you've opened a, you've opened you've opened this up now. Anyway, let's move on to the questions. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I think now will be a time to uh, remind people that are listening to the Running Channel podcast. And then next, we've got questions from the people sat right in front of us. First, apologies for my phone going off. <laughs> um, you've owned it; it's fine. Uh, okay, thank you. Introduce um, yourself and okay. tell us where you're from. Okay, my name's Sarah. Sarah Vishai, and I live in Bury St Edmunds with my husband Mike, who's awesome. doing the marathon tomorrow. Yes, and, good luck. Uh, I did the um, Manchester Marathon last Sunday, and I did it in 4:46. Not a brilliant time, but I think that my sounds first. great. I think it's deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but. My Garmin watch says that um, I can do it in uh, 4.03. I think that's quite a challenge. But well, believe this, in yourself. Well, I will, I will. But what do you think I should do to make that? What do I need to do to make that a reality? And, and how long do you think it would take me to do it? So do you wear your Garmin kind of every waking moment? Like Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, just cause <laughs> the, 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 first, uh, yeah. the first question is on an accuracy, right? I'm not saying that Garmin's inaccurate. I'm just saying that like, the prediction that a watch makes for you is going to be based on how much data it has. Yeah. So if you're um, not wearing it all of the time, then yeah. you're not going to get an accurate reading. Similarly, um, it, a lot of it infers from heart rate. Mm-hmm. So again, a lot of it will depend on how accurate the heart rate is. So mm-hmm. like if you're not wearing it tightly enough, then you're not mm-hmm. going to get an accurate heart rate reading. Um, if you wear a, a, a chest strap, that's probably the most accurate way. Mm-hmm. That then, then then all of the algorithms work out, okay, based on all the training you've been doing, this is how fast you could run. They are uncomfortable, those chest straps, though, aren't mm-hmm. they? You know, you, I'm not saying you'd need to wear that all the time. <laughs> Don't wear that every waking yeah. moment. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that one's just for activities. So when you're actually running. Am um, I right in saying as well that with those predictions, because when I first saw those predictions, I was like, wow, I could just step outside my door and like run a ridiculous marathon <laughs> time. But that's it predicting post doing a training block. So it doesn't just mean that like any kind of moment you're going to be able to do those times. Well, in theory, it, it should mean that you can do it. Now, um, I, that's my understanding. Um, race predictor is, is like your current level of fitness. Oh, no, as in like just when you cycle through them. So it will give you like your predicted like 5K, 10K. So you yeah. could be out, you could be training for a 5K and then it will give you those Oh, yeah, that's true. Like, so right well. now I would say my, give you a marathon prediction time. But then yeah. my longest run in the last six months is like 10K. So I yeah, yeah. Um, obviously couldn't go and do that right now. Sorry, to answer your question yeah, yeah, okay. is it's how right, do you get okay. from, say, 4.45 to closer to four hours? Yeah. Um, so... Maybe I need to ask. I don't see when people email in. We can't ask for the context, but like, how much are you running at the moment? Um, about five days a okay. week. And the variety in that training is it? Is it all just the same, or do you do you um, mix it up? Yeah, I, I do mix it up. Yeah. Um, but I know that I probably ought to increase sort of weight training and things like that. I know Sarah and I had a bit of a chat before, and I know how much she loves. I still hate it's the gym. To Sarah, though, isn't it? Actually, what you no, said before the worse, podcast was, uh, "Is Sarah still complaining about weight training?" Or someone I said, did not. <laughs> <laughs> "Yes, yes, I am." <laughs> yeah, um, that's a big leap, and it depends on how close to your red line you might have felt running the. the yeah. Was and was it for your first marathon in Manchester? It was my first marathon. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's loads of stuff that goes into this, which is how fast you set off, which I imagine was fairly conservatively because it's your first. I marathon. was negative splits. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so that means quite, so okay. Well, that's a good boost. sign too, right? Yeah. So that definitely shows that you can run faster yeah. already. We're aiming for negative splits, but it's very difficult to do. Yeah. So running the second half faster than the first yeah. half, mm-hmm. and it's smart for your first marathon to set off at a pace that you know that you can sustain. Well, I was yeah. listening to all of you guys in my head. Yeah. Was so <laughs> yeah, that's the problem yeah. if you've already yeah. been listening to us. Me. So just, yeah. It really did help me. Oh, I don't think I could have done it without the... Oh, oh that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we didn't ask you to say that. So that's, uh, <laughs> no one's going to believe that. It's no, a prop- that's true. We've we got a plant in the crowd. Yeah. No. No. Focusing more on race pace so that you're confident at that race pace. So mm-hmm. I think it would still be foolish to immediately go, oh, my watch tells me I can run four hours, so I run 4.45. I'm just going to assume I can improve by 45 minutes. That's a mm-hmm. massive improvement. Mm-hmm. But I think if you've run a negative split, your watch is giving you some good fitness data that shows that you've got that capacity. Yeah. Then you can aim a little bit higher next time and say, try and run 4.30. Yeah. Um, and, and in doing that, you'll then get the confidence. I'm not saying I know how many marathons you're looking forward to doing, but um, getting the, the confidence from doing 4.30 race pace to start with and then building up your long runs and throwing in race pace blocks in those long runs, mm-hmm. doing workouts either side of that new race pace. So that will then change your 10K and half marathon pace and all the stuff you'll run in threshold running and so on like that. And it's, it's all about, any distance is about confidence. And the more confidence you'll have will be from doing more training at and around that pace. So basically, I'd say, believe it, but take it with a pinch of salt. Okay. Uh, and don't put any limits on yourself. That's what Kipchoge would say, right? Like, yeah. no human is limited. <laughs> um, 
And Actually, got a good anecdote for you should ask us in just one second. I'll finish your question, but Sorry. then Sarah, I, I need to call Sarah out for, uh, for Again? Kipchoge, right? For what? For Kipchoge, like uh, we had to have a restraining order taken out. <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is this not true? <sighs> right. Okay. Let me explain. So, oh, okay. Segway already. A few years ago, we I think Anna DM'd Kipchoge on Twitter, yes. and he on the running channel account and he replied or someone from his team replied yeah. with a WhatsApp number. Mm -hmm. We now all have that WhatsApp or like a few of us have that WhatsApp number on our phones. I'm not going to give it out <laughs> <laughs> before anyone asks that as their next question. Oh, we could have um, done that, but we could have given our number out and then we'd have had loads of people messaging the running channel. So. I didn't know this story. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So then, and if you add that WhatsApp number to your phone, it is like a picture of Kipchoge that pops up as the thing. So yeah, it probably proof. is him. So when I was in Berlin and he was running Berlin, I uh, dropped him a WhatsApp. <laughs> I can't remember what it said, but it was definitely something like, hey mate. <laughs> <laughs> Heard you're in Berlin. I think it was something along the lines of like, hi, I'm such a huge fan. I'd love to like speak to you. It got read. But I got ghosted, so oh. I'm, I'm many, still waiting many, for my uh, kitchen you reply. How many messages have you sent him since then? Probably about five. <laughs> <laughs> have you been blocked? So, to be no. clear as well, we're not no. calling out Elo Kipchoge here at all. I'm just making fun of Sarah. <laughs> One day he will reply. I imagine and he's then, fairly in demand. Yeah, yeah, he is fairly in demand. <laughs> One thing I would say on that as well is that if you've just run a marathon, then don't put any pressure on yourself to go straight back into another marathon training cycle. Like even, even the elites will go into a shorter training block. So if they've got a marathon coming up, like no elite is constantly training for a marathon, they're gonna go back into 5K, 10K training and then build up again. And that actually will have a huge difference. So focus on a little bit of speed, keep that kind of marathon yeah. goal in your mind. And then when you build back up to it, your legs will, you need to go to the gym as well, but speed work's also strength good for work. strength. Okay, okay. Yeah, my coach would always have said that people would run a really good five or 10K in that following, once they'd recover from the marathon in that mm. following period then, because mm. you're really aerobically fit. And so if you can take advantage of that aerobic fitness by putting some inverted commas speed work, so five, 10K training in, then yeah. you can really reap the benefits. And, and broadly that then starts the cycle again, like Sarah said, you can put in a big period of five or 10K training, yeah. and then that sets you up for the classic 12 week marathon period and after marathon training 5k training feels so easy like the yeah. speed won't but yeah. the just the amount of running that you're doing in the distance you'll get to the end of like a 5k long run and be like wow yeah. i've got the whole day left <laughs> <laughs> brilliant thanks guys. okay good luck sarah cheers thank you hi um i'm lucy hello, hello um lucy. i'm running london tomorrow for the first time yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um and i found that during my long runs, long lonely runs, I was surprised by how much mantras helped me carry on. So I was wondering what some of your guys' favorite mantras are when you're really finding it tough to carry on. Um, <laughs> so I've talked about this one a lot, but my personal favorite marathon one has always been run the mile you're in. That for me in Berlin was such a game changer because I think when, when you've run your first, you're worried about like, I'm guessing you haven't run a full marathon distance in training. So there is that element of the unknown and that's always gonna play on your mind. It, no one will run a marathon without thinking about the last mile, but if you can just focus and go, like, right, run the mile I'm in. I did a like a check every single time I let my mind wander and go, oh, I can't keep this pace up or oh, I'm not going to be able to finish. I'm going to have to stop. Or, I won't get to the finish line. I would just go like, right, can you run right now? Yes. Are you so tired you're going to fall over? No. Okay, <laughs> shut up, carry on. <laughs> it's, it's the harsh conversation I'd have with myself. Um, yeah, this uh, not necessarily for a marathon, but I do think it applies to all distances. Mine was more focused on, or my self-talk, I suppose, was always focused on the fact that you always feel worse than you think you should. Yeah. Um, and that's normal. So that, like, if, if I'm saying that I felt like that, even at competing at a really high level, um, that that's totally, because you always want to feel amazing. So in the 1500 meters, I'm only running for three or four minutes, but I had to accept the fact that in that first one minute where I know that I've still just got to keep up, I always felt rubbish. Um, or uh, the, particularly the closer I'd get to the race, the, doing a run like maybe with the run we did this morning, the day before a race, you're thinking, well, I only ran 5K here and I'm quite I'm quite tired. I'm quite, how am I going to possibly going to run 42K tomorrow? Everyone has that same sense of, one, you feel rubbish the closer it gets to the event. And then two, in the event itself, there'll be points where you're thinking, I should feel better than this. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing to kind of cling on to. That's not true. Like, it's really normal to feel like that. And certainly when you care about something, um, I think with a marathon as well, you can kind of 
start to the more you do them you can kind of start to pinpoint the moments where you expect you're going to feel bad and where you expect you're going to feel amazing so like for me I know that a runner's high always happens about 40 minutes in so like no That's matter pretty early <laughs> it's quite early <laughs> How do you get to the rest of it? <laughs> well, well, no. And then I know that I'm going to have a massive dip if I don't have food. And then I'm going to get a high again yeah. once I've had some good food. So 40 minutes yeah. in is usually when I would take my first bit of food. So that like gets rid of the first dip. Yeah. And then I go into another good one. And then I'd always try to like preempt with food. So then like in the moment where I feel rubbish, I'm just like, but I'm eating. So yeah. it's great. <laughs> do you not eat very often at work then? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, stuck with you all day. So. <laughs> I see, I see those savage dips. Um, <laughs> another, another thing. That I, yeah, don't have a meeting with me before lunch. It's <laughs> all you love for Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jess is nodding. <laughs> um, off wow. Camera, yeah. Um, the the another thing I was going to say is that I like to reframe it um, when it gets hard. Uh, there's always a point in a, any event where you feel like you don't want to do it anymore or you don't want to keep pushing or you don't want to push through. Um, and uh, I had the luxury of working with a, a sports psychologist and what we worked on was reframing it as opportunity, not as kind of, I don't know, expenditure or, or, or things that you don't want to do. So every time I was thinking, I don't want to do this, or in my case, that would often be someone else pushing the pace in a race and me thinking, well, I, if I don't keep up, I don't get a chance to win. So that was the way I would change it in my mind. And, and from a marathon context, this is your first ever marathon, so your opportunity is to finish and to have this amazing experience. So when it gets hard, it's thinking, no, yeah, this pain, this, this um, discomfort is, is fleeting and carrying on is my opportunity to, to achieve the thing that I'm looking for. So like having, for me, that was a really powerful word was opportunity. Like this is my chance. This is my, my yeah. There's also, I feel like on social media this year, I've seen even more of, I can't remember the exact percentage. I'm so bad at maths, but it's something like... And Rick will help us out. 0.1% of people in the world have run a marathon. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a really like, small, it's a really small number. billion people in the world and not that many have run a marathon. So like, even if you are struggling, because I use the, yeah. well, thousands of people have run a marathon. Of course I can do it. But then that's not very useful when you're like, but I can't finish it. But as soon as you cross that line, you've joined 0.1%, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah even, 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 in. few, even fewer in Great Britain, actually. <laughs> run a marathon, you know, on this desk. <laughs> uh, just keep it coming. <laughs> he's got see, nothing. Every time he's yeah. got even less. I, I, sh I should probably say something nice about Andy. Um, <laughs> but deep. I won't. No, I've got. I've got. I've got. <laughs> hang, on, hang on. No, I found something. Found something. Uh, so obviously they've just got back from from Boston, and there's this really famous hill in Boston. What's it called? The Heart Attack Hill. Heartbreak Hill. Heartbreak <laughs> Hill. Uh, and Andy, you know, we all, you know, take the mick out of him thinking he's, you know, a bit rubbish now and retired. But actually, he's just come back and run the second fastest time ever on Heartstop Hill. Heartbreak Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we put it on uh, MySpace, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, I like how that was a compliment, but you still managed to call him old and past it. <laughs> Yeah. Getting to that. Do you want to talk about your mantra before you dig yourself another hole? Um, my mantra, survive. I, <laughs> uh, uh, I always just get stuff in my head. Like my mantra is always generally kind of a lot of, a lot of the time a song maybe I've got in my head or something that just kind of sticks around. Oh, go on, give Keep us an going, example. Mile by mile, mile by mile. I will always love you was the first thing that came to my mind. I remember it was in it's my the whole slow, way, the whole quite a slow song. Yeah, the whole way through London, I had that about I don't I don't know what I was thinking about. Thinking that you love yourself, you, potentially. <laughs> generally, I always get a, a, a song stuck in my head. I know you break it down like this. What we'd call it? Mile by mile. Chunking. 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 Just yeah. get to the next set of yeah. balloons. I think some people like to work in like huge chunks. Some people like to yeah. work in little chunks. I know James, presenter on the own channel, he loves using a mantra which makes up every single footstep. So when he's been running, he's used, I think it's always forward, forward, always. And he will say that on every single, like always forward, forward, That's always. Good. I find that that breaks it down too much. Oh, it, <laughs> because you, I'm like, wow, I've done 10 times. steps and I haven't got far yeah. enough. But for some people, for some people that like yeah. Paula Radcliffe, I think counts. Yeah, she used to count to really? 100. And if she knew that if she counted to 100, she'd run a mile, I think. Is that right? Something like that. <laughs> oh, Andy can't do your maths. <laughs> no, she definitely run a mile in 100. But I think she used to count to 100 and she'd know roughly how far that meant she had run. Oh, I yeah. see. And then she'd just start counting to 100 again. Yeah. Keep going, I think don't that's fall like, apart. Yeah. 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 It's good though. Just find one that works for you. And you might find it mid-race. 
and then be like, oh, I remember in London, I found this thing. Yeah, yeah people hold up signs, actually. You might find that you'll cling on to, to a message in one of the signs that, uh, that really resonates with you. So. Like, remember, you paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that my favourite. Yeah, that's a good one. Awesome. Should we have another question? Yes. Hi, I'm Patricia from Mexico. I am also running the London Marathon tomorrow yeah. for a charity. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you have any good tips for slow, starting slow, because I've been struggling to start slow. Um, my problem is that I kind of get bored. <laughs> and even though I got my watch, um, that it's like telling me to go to sl go slow, um, I just simply can't. I feel like my legs feel even heavier if I'm starting slow than if I am doing like my regular pace. So any good tips on uh, that? Well, that, that's hard. So you're saying that even if you use something like Pace Pro on your watch, you, you would ignore it? I mean, I tried not to ignore it, yeah. but my legs do something different. So, <laughs> so have, you, have you run in a marathon as big as London before? Or? Yeah, so I did Brighton in 2021 and then okay. I did the virtual London Marathon. Got it. Okay. So uh, there's an element of sometimes a big marathon like London can force you to slow down in the first two or three miles because it's so busy that you can't run at your... So a lot of people almost have the opposite problem where when the courses kind of come together, I think it's about three miles because mm. um, there's three different starts. You, it opens up a little bit more as people thin out and then people try to make up the time that they've lost in those first two or three miles. So you might find tomorrow that it's not a massive problem, but otherwise I think you just have to have the, the psychology of them. But like, if I don't slow down, I will pay for this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because yeah, it applies across any distance broadly that if you're going to be X percent too fast at, a quarter of the way or halfway, you'll lose more than that percentage later on mm -hmm. in the race by by getting too tired. So, you know, you could be five minutes too fast to halfway and ultimately end up losing 10 or 15 minutes. So banking time, I don't think works. So. It also doesn't have to be so much slower than what your target pace might be. So okay. for, for like when I ran a soccer marathon earlier in the year, I my coach gave me like a chunk it pacing plan and I started off at... Uh, I think it was 5.30 per kilometre for the first 10K. Then it went to 5.15 for the next 10K. Then, yeah, then five. And then the last 10K was up to me, which was a terrible decision. Because <laughs> I was like, I am not going any faster. I find that, that quite psychologically difficult, knowing I was going to have to get faster throughout. Yeah, the third one was terrifying. I think, no, I think the third one was 5.10 maybe. But all of all of those little increases, like it wasn't, it wasn't I was going a minute slower. Okay. Um, and then when I ran Berlin before, I made sure that the first 2K was slower. I think to run sub four, you need like 5.37, I want to say. It's a really annoying number. 541. 541. Sorry. 541. Yeah. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Um, but I think my first kilometers were slower, but only by about three seconds mm. per kilometer. So it doesn't need to be so much slower that it, it feels like mechanically wrong or okay. it feel... It, I don't know, it, it like feels like it's hurting more because you're going so much slower than you're used to, but it just definitely shouldn't be faster than what your target pace is. Because okay. that psychologically is really going to help you towards the end of the race because what will yeah. start to play on your mind is, oh, those first 5K, I went too fast. I've like, I've ruined it. Mm -hmm. So there are the sensible answers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's you, he going to say? You could just have a massive roast dinner on the start line. <laughs> And gradually, as it begins to get out of your system, you speed up. <laughs> practical, other other practical. options available. I'm practical literally envisaging someone on the London Marathon start line. You know when they like pan to people on the TV yeah, yeah. and it's someone just sat down with like a picnic yes. table. <laughs> <laughs> Tucking in the, like, the, the napkin, yeah. yeah. Chicken right. or beef. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I will be chunking, so thanks for that. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Chunk it, chunk it. Yeah, chunk really good. It. Have we got those t-shirts, mate? We need no, to we need a bit of chunk it, mate. Uh, hi guys, it's um, Michelle from, uh, oh, I live in Cambridge now, but I'm from the US. Um, oh, awesome. And I was wondering Welcome. if you could uh, run a marathon in some sort of fancy dress, what would you choose to run in? Or a costume oh, or something like that. Oh no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, Andy hasn't run a marathon yet, yeah. so uh, <laughs> let's take the time to choose his first outfit. Well, I think, yeah, maybe you guys can choose what I should wear. I mean, oh. you're wearing pink right now, so immediately my mind's gone to like full ballerina outfit. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'd, embra like, I'd embrace that with a tutu. And, no, and the point shoes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Injury prone enough as it is, I don't think you need to be throwing more barriers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, because I've got so many children that they, uh, <laughs> 
So the suggestion there, if it wasn't on mic, was that I should let the children choose my uh, outfit for the marathon. Yeah, just do a poll at the school. <laughs> <laughs> they do try to choose my outfits. Oh, Daddy, don't wear those shoes. Oh, that's not for running. That's just in everyday life. No. <laughs> I, th- I think the sensible answer for me would be going as a Chippendale because I wouldn't have to wear much. <laughs> What's a... But sorry. The, the, What's, oh, like that'd be like Magic Mike. Magic Mike. Yeah, Chippendale. A stripper. Yeah, you don't watch that on your show? Uh, no. Your show on, no. Okay. Me and Rick are obviously <laughs> clearly into it. Um, sorry, that passed me by. Uh, but actually, one of the, my worst running moments was actually during a marathon in the last 100 metres when a guy with a massive Christ on the cross <laughs> attached to his back... <laughs> ran past me <laughs> at some pace. And I thought I was going fast. I mean, this was a couple of days in, but you know, it, 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 was, it was a low moment. Yeah, that, that's the, Followed by a very high moment of finishing. Yeah, because there's some incredible world records where people have run. Yeah. I mean, I think that the faster those world records get, the more, not tenuous the fancy dresses, but the more kind of, they're wearing technical running clothing that has been made into like a, pretty cool outfit as opposed to like running with a fridge on your back or something yeah <laughs> why do people do that there's always a fridge guy every year yeah, do you remember that I'm, I'm just not going to look up now in case just, they're in the room I just always want to know if the fridge has stuff in it <laughs> yeah. no like if you're carrying a fridge is your mentality like okay this is uh, the equivalent of a hydration vest well, I've yeah, got like my electrolytes <laughs> in there I've got how would you, or then could you, you access the how fridge would you get it out? Yeah. well I think then as you get to an aid station you'd just be like could you open me up <laughs> <laughs> not in a weird way so those people are volunteering all day question Michelle it's uh, fridge no no Chippendale <laughs> and uh, whatever, my, whatever my children choose yeah. right, no right. can I submit another entry go on I would love to do it as a team and there was a team last year that ran it as a fruit bowl and I'd like to do that. They were running pretty fast, though. I think so they just had... like a, you like between you, you make up some kind of still life. Of like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and people can draw us yeah. as we run by. Yeah. <laughs> but which fruit? Ooh, I, I love which the way you pin that down. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. A kiwi. I was thinking kiwi. Interesting. Yeah, kiwi. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. quite quite fitting because I think yeah. I'm slightly allergic to kiwi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Hi guys, um, I'm Kevin. I'm from Dublin, but living in London for the last year. Awesome. Um, and I ran my first marathon in Manchester as well. Last oh, week. congrats. Yeah. 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 Every, everyone has singularly come to make me feel inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I did find is I was aerobically fine for the whole marathon, mm. but around 30K, it was my quads just started killing me. Now, I could get through it fine. Like I went through some painful times, but I, but I got through it and got my time. But what would you recommend in terms of like getting the legs able to handle that because I do hit the strength and conditioning twice a week with the legs specifically. Good man. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've been doing four runs a week, but maybe do I increase the amount of runs I do? Do I increase the volume? Yeah, obviously from a, an actually experiencing that perspective, I'm not the best person to comment, but ultimately that's my main fear this year. So is I'm not as worried having had the level of fitness I had previously about the aerobic side of things. Like, can I run for that long and, and with my breathing and, and cardiovascular system be okay yeah i think that'll be all right but the the i'm just worried my body's not gonna be able to take it so mm. so like that's why i'm trying to work hard in the gym i think that you might i don't know what your longest run was like if, if you were experiencing 32 that. did 32. you did you ever sorry i'm just gonna mm. quiz you now did you ever run the day after a long run um sometimes i do like a 5k just like easy pace the day after just to kind of loosen out the legs yeah, yeah i wonder whether there's a way of um of, of like running fatigued where you try to, to back up harder runs next to each other, um, not constantly in your training plan. But if that's a specific problem that you've experienced, obviously I'm not going to say as you go and run 40K in your run to go and experience it again, but you might need to like nudge your long run slightly longer so that you are confident that's not going to happen. Um, or you might need to think about maybe not going the full 30K, but going to a little bit less. And then the next day also running quite long so that you're, putting your body through that fatigue with a little bit less risk than going really long in, in one run, but not doing that every week. Mm. I think you want confidence, right? I think that's the, the so to, to, to be sure that you've kind of tried to simulate it without risking cramp and, and then injury. Mm-hmm. Also, I'd suggest if you can get to go see a physio who can give you like a full kind of body checkup, MOT, they'll be able to give you exercises which are kind of specifically targeting that. I know that that's yeah. something that me and Andy have done. And the exercises that they give you like I had week 
my ho- <laughs> I was going to say I have specific areas. My whole leg is <laughs> just, <laughs> just so weak. Yeah. But they were, uh, the exercises that I got given look like they just wouldn't, like it wasn't, I wasn't allowed to lift any weight <laughs> because I'm just not there yet. Mm. But the exercises that I was doing, I was given a whole glute routine where all the movements were like really small. They're working on like little micro sections of your leg, but actually that that's going to help as well. Yeah, because you said you're in the gym, but mm-hmm. but just making sure, again, it'd be doing the right, right? Stuff. making sure yeah, that yeah. someone's analysed it because it, there might be a particular small or muscle or it might be what Sarah's talking about there, like inner range or outer range is a big difference. Like you could be doing exercises that you think are targeting your quads that, that but it might not be the quads that are the problem because actually generally what happens with injuries or things like this is that there's a weakness somewhere else and so the another area of your body has to compensate and do all mm-hmm. of the hard work so then your quads would have been working really hard possibly because some other element of your mechanical chain is what's actually weak so it does so yeah. make a lot of sense because i did have achilles injuries leading up to it now i've right. seen video for that but maybe my quads were compensating for my weak ankles for sure yeah if you can't have that ankle flexion and the drive then that drive has to come from somewhere else. So it's really likely that, yeah, this is always, uh, I always have to force myself to remember it, but it's always baffled me sometimes when I've had an, an injury that I'll, often the place where I get the injury or the pain is is completely unrelated to mm. what the actual problem is. So the weakness is usually somewhere else and then the body compensates. So That's always the funny thing when you go see the physio, they'll ask you what's wrong and then they'll be like, okay, <laughs> Let, <laughs> let's have a look. <laughs> yeah, see, often I've, I've walked into... I, again, had the luxury of working with these uh, incredible physios on um, Olympic teams or whatever. And I've, I've seen them, they've done it with me and I've seen them do it with other people. You almost walk in the room and they're like, okay. And they, and they, they immediately go, it hurts here, here and here. And you're like, oh yeah, that's exactly where it hurts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, that, that they're like, find someone, someone good um, and, and uh, invest in that physio too. Like, I guess don't, don't balk at the, at the prices that mm-hmm. you'll have to pay to see a good private physio. Um, because if you see them, you might not have to see them very often. Whereas if you see a potentially someone less skilled with runners in particular, yeah. then y- they might be cheaper in that first appointment, but you're going back every few weeks because you're not really seeing the progress and also do what they tell you to do, which is what very few people do. They, they yeah. like, go and do these exercises and you're oh, yeah, brilliant. I'll do those. And then life gets in the way. So hmm. next question. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. I'm Harvey. Uh, I'm from Newcastle originally, but I've lived in London for a long time. Hey, I've mate. done 25 marathons. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. wow. So I think Harvey yeah. in the room, yes. I, uh, no, that, I, that I think we should stop now. <laughs> <laughs> that means I've made every mistake it's possible to make, okay. give or take. I've probably yeah. got a few yeah. left I could still make, obviously. <laughs> um, and, and I guess mine is back to the mantras. Andy, you said a thing which is a version on something else a while ago which was most people don't know what they're capable of. Yeah. Mm. And it really, really resonated with me. After having done all of that and come up with all the mantras and the self-talk that you could possibly think of and all the different ways of chugging, et cetera, that's what comes back to me over and over again. I don't know what I'm capable of. And I, and I suppose I was wondering, what did you mean by, by that? Yeah, so we've talked about this a few times on, on the podcast. And I guess what I meant is I've often seen a lot of people running in different events, uh, doesn't matter what distance. Uh, and they would say to me, I can't, possibly go any faster i I was at my maximum there's no idea i can imagine how i could be better than that Uh, my answer is broadly that i've watched you and that's not true because i i think there's a skill in being able to find your your hundred percent and and um i've trained with a lot of people who are pretty poor in training actually not poor but like in training you wouldn't have predicted the races they're able to then run but they they had an incredible ability to to really go to a place that a lot of people can't go to in races. I'm not saying that everyone needs to find this extreme where they're going to, you know, collapse at the end of a race. Were you quite a lazy trainer? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I was... Just you always take the lift instead of taking the stairs. Oh, uh, yeah, that was outside of training. Though. So uh, I, was, I was lazy. Right, 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 right. I was lazy. That was a tactic, Rick. Yeah, yeah, was so, a... Yeah, so, yeah. I, was, I was lazy away yeah. from training. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So I would have avoided any unnecessary movement all day outside of actual running. Um, but, but in terms of... It's, it's, a, it's a trained skill, I think, to be able to, to find where your limit is. And actually, I don't think you can get the most out of yourself until you've found that limit. And that might be in a session that you actually, you go too hard and you can't finish that, that training session. And then you go, okay, well, that was my limit. So I need to back off from that a little bit. And I'm, I'm not talking about going so hard that you overload yourself. But I'm talking about every now and again in a, in a workout, you try a pace that you would like to achieve. And then if you can't do that in a kind of simulator type environment. So if you were doing training for 10K and you did 10 times a K and you can't do 
10 times a K with recovery at your race pace, then that race pace is too fast for you. Um, but you need to push your, push your boundaries occasionally in order to have that discomfort and see what you can actually, what actually do. And, and one of the ways of doing that as well is second to last or third from last interval in an interval session is making that the one that you go really hard on. Mm. Um, and then if you can still pick up the pace that you're averaging for the first set of reps and the final rep or the final two reps, then you're like, oh, actually, I, I've, I've, got, I've, I've dug deeper than I thought I could because otherwise I'd have saved everything for that one last interval and then gone really hard. But if you can do it mentally before the last one and then still pick it up again for the last one, then you've all, that's a way of finding something in yourself that you might not have realised that you had. Uh, hi, uh, Paul from Wharton near Preston in Lancashire. Lovely. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you. I came to the Shakeout Run last year. Uh, oh, awesome. For London Marathon in October. London Marathon yeah. in October and uh, London Marathon. I had the best run of my life. Oh, oh, and that was all down to the Shakeout. Uh, yeah. all, down, all down to you guys. It's amazing. Oh, well, congratulations. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, but yes, yeah, so both after that run, I ran Manchester as well last week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> A lot of Manchester runners. In I've there, never so. felt so yeah. inadequate. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but after both runs, my legs were fine on the run, fine yeah. on the day. But afterwards, I couldn't walk properly until the Thursday. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips to get rid of DOMS at all? Oh, can I ask a question first? Yes. Talk me through exactly what you did after you crossed the finish line. Yeah, that was um, I had to walk back to the car, so it's a, it was a good mile, mile and a half back to the car. Yeah. Then what did you do when you Drove got to the car? Drove home for an hour and yeah, then got home, home, had a bath. Yeah. Had a bath, okay. And then uh, how soon after did you have some food? Um, as soon as I got home, so it'd be about an hour and a half or so after the marathon. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that, that, I mean, all of those things were, are not ideal, probably. So... <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> Andy, you haven't even run a marathon. No. You, you, <laughs> I was very good at recovering from stuff, though. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was the lazy bit. Step one, get in the lift, don't walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, ironically here, um, I can had the sort of various... Exp so my wife has actually also run a significant number of marathons, so she, she's much more experienced than I am. But, but having been with her on, on those, um, the ones where she stopped immediately afterwards, I know you walked a mile, um, but actually she, she ran New York and, and there was a really lengthy walk to, to get baggage. And then I kind of, not deliberately at the time, made her walk quite a long way back to the hotel and stuff. Um, and that's the quickest she's recovered from a marathon was by sort of right. being forced to gently walk a little bit more and not stop moving mm. in that period. Mm. Yeah. And also the, an hour and a half is a long time before refueling, I think. It's the opposite yeah. of what you think you've got to do. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. You, you would you, think you, like I've run 26 miles. I need to lie down, yeah. not do anything, sleep. Yeah. Um, I have another question. After your long runs in training, did you practice any recovery techniques? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. You're like feeding this for us. So if in the same way that we always say have a rehearsal for race day in terms of like eating breakfast, doing the routine that you're going to do, mm. practicing with your kit, practicing the run, practice chunking, all of that stuff, that doesn't stop when you stop your watch. So I found from a soccer marathon, I recovered the best I ever have because I actually planned after the race more than I did before the race. Obviously, Nobody you know, not, does that, do they, really? No, but it, but it then means that you can... So I was going on holiday straight after, so I had... Yeah, the motivation I, to be yeah, recovered. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I stupidly booked skiing for like five days after the marathon. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, if I don't recover, I'm going to pay for this. Um, but I practiced loads of different things in training from like compression socks, which really helped me um, using like different stuff in a bath as well. So like a bath is really good, but if you can get... Oh, what's it called? Epsom salts, Epsom salts or magnesium or yeah. or in if there. You can, if you can bear to do it, maybe some kind of like contrast bath. Yeah, uh, the so science I, is, The science is sort of a bit here and there as to, to whether it works, but psychologically, it, broadly recovery and, and uh, performance, a lot of it is psychological. So if yeah. you can mm. do something that you feel will help you, that it's pretty likely to help you. Yeah. The one thing I would say is that if you've if you've run a marathon, you're never going to get to the stage where a day or two days later it doesn't feel like you have. No, <laughs> if you've if you've like but, but gone he was, he was hard. talking a week on Thursday later, so you know it is about yeah. speeding it up. Isn't yeah. It? So it's I think if you want to like quicken it up a little bit, I think it's accepting that those like first two to three days you're still going to feel like some discomfort in your legs, and also as well, if you're jumping back into training, the official like there are loads of papers on how many marathons should you run and I think the official thing is 
one or two every 12 months. And that's not like wow. January to December and then go again. Yeah. That's like in a 12 month rolling 12 yeah, months. Yeah. So actual recovery from a marathon, like two, three weeks later, you're still going to have loads of little tears in your muscles that are recovering. So it's also just being aware of that. And whilst in the same way that if you're ill, our advice is always like, add one more day than the first day that you feel like 100% yeah. better because there's probably still something going on. Yeah. Be aware that you've done like a huge thing, like you've run a marathon, your muscles need a little bit more time. So like the more you can help them in those weeks after, the better they're going to feel both then and like going into your next training block as well. Yeah, embrace the doms. You kind of earned them. Embrace yeah, the yeah. doms. Embrace, embrace as the you, Good mate, pain. you haven't Good run a marathon, pain. you can't say embrace the doms. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? The first thing I'm going to say to you the day after your marathon. Yeah. Hey, mate, embrace the dumps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> embrace the good. dumps. It's so pain, well conditioned it? from the gym. It's good pain. It's good pain. It's pain that you deserve to get. That's what I meant by embrace yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Like, as in, you've, you've, when you do something for the first time or, or you're doing something that's hard, then, then there's, a, there's some pleasure in the, the pain of, the, the, of that, I think. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, like I say, you, you can call me out on that when I disagree. It's like an extra little medal, isn't it? But I've, I'm just assuming... I'm Pain as, when you sit down to go to the toilet. I'm assuming all of the fancy new foam and all that stuff, like when I run the marathon. Oh yeah, uh, you're going to be fine. No, it'll be fine. I'll just be able yeah. to go again the, the, the next day. So our final question <laughs> from our live audience. Um, so Patricia again. No, no. Um, I want to ask you, what was the decisive moment that made you think that it was time to do a rebranding for the running channel? Oh, that, that, I thought you were going to say what was the decisive moment that you wanted to run a marathon and I'm like oh <laughs> that's another question Andy can't I, answer I, I, think one, yeah, yeah. I, oh. I think this is one for Andy though isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. we've touched briefly on the, on the kind of the logic for it of, of having um, we had a logo that, that a friend made we, we were doing everything kind of for the first time um, and then now we we have more than just YouTube, I suppose, is, is part, part of that. So, so the website has been completely changed. Um, we want to make sure that people who engage with us and feel supported by the running channel on Instagram or TikTok or wherever that might be or in the podcast, um, they, it's slightly different in each of those places so that, that you're not just seeing repeats of content in, in, one, in one place or the other, that you can kind of choose how you want to consume bits and pieces from the running channel and and a lot of that comes from you guys like we share a lot of amazing stuff that gets sent to us as well uh like hearing your experiences in marathons and uh, in marathons here and so we just decided that it was time to um make sure that how we look kind of reflects the fact that we've been doing it for four years and um that exactly what we've done for the last four years um needed to change slightly to just be a, a little bit of an update really so it's not um meant in any way to put out the people that have come with us on this journey for kind of the first four years it's more supposed to be this exciting chance to kick off the next four or five years doing some really cool stuff it's um, also about like celebrating just how how we've grown and like how much bigger mm -hmm. like without without the people who are watching this live here or listening along to this or watching it on youtube we mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to have this pop-up or rebrand or have merch so it's more of a way of being like thank you so much for supporting us and this is us hopefully giving you something that you're excited to see more buy if you yeah. want to get the merch eventually that'll be coming soon yes yeah watch this space for that but yeah it's, it's, it's about giving everyone something that feels like really inclusive it feels like this massive global running community or run club where um we hope we feel like the kind of the, the friends of people listening, yeah. like like you should feel like you're listening to your your friends in the pub talking about running, um, who are just passionate about it and want to help people um, to enjoy running in the way yeah. that we've found enjoyment through running for lots of different reasons on this this table right here. Do you like the new kit? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You know that the most difficult thing about designing this kit was making sure the new logo didn't go on our nipples. <laughs> 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 you laugh. But <laughs> yeah, just quickly, Andy, do you want to touch on what the new logo means? <laughs> last drink? Oh my, yeah, goodness, well done. Um, yeah, so the new logo is, is essentially it's an asterisk, uh, and, and an asterisk stands for more. It stands for support, so supporting the main text. If you have an asterisk, it's usually like a footnote as well, which is obviously a brilliant pun on on running, um, <laughs> or we liked it anyway. Um, and so yeah, it's an asterisk, which means that we we're trying to support the running community um, and help people with their running. So that's what the asterisk means. It's also sort of slightly rotating, so it's it's uh, designed to kind of. 
show progress and movement, um, which is ultimately what we're about, getting people moving, helping them to see progress, uh, and then the, the, the strap line run, improve, repeat. So to see kind of uh, improvement, whatever that might be. So improving mental health, improving fitness, um, all of that exciting stuff. Now, you mentioned Instagram and TikTok earlier. Oh, no. I've... We all know that Andy is the least likely person to know, one, what they are, and two, <laughs> post on them. However, if you are lucky enough to currently be one of Andy's followers on Instagram, you will know that the last time he posted a photo was... August 2012. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that photo? It was um, of the flame in the Olympic Stadium. Yeah, really grainy, like really bad. No, it was a filter. Black right. and white. <laughs> Sorry, great photography. Um, now, me and Rick have obviously been on socials sharing the rebrand and we turned to Andy and shared some photos with him and he was like, well, I just don't have Instagram. And we thought- just Put them on LinkedIn. What? <laughs> <laughs> What better way to launch Andy into the 21st century? Yeah, than to ask the, uh, this is this is Sarah's idea, to challenge um, obviously people in this room uh, and also the podcast audience, so if you're listening to this, to follow me uh, on Instagram. Uh, I'm at runbadders. Um, so cool. So cool. <laughs> because, so cool. Uh, he, he's trying really hard not to sound desperate. He's trying <laughs> really it's hard. It was, it was cooler when I, so all my friends when I was running called me badders. Um, and that is slightly cringe now, but that's what so it is. So was it a play on like run, forest, run? And you wanted people to well, be no, like... Well, no, just people call me bad as and I run. So that was that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't put quite as much thought into that as the rebrand, but that's okay. Um, um, so I asked Andy to post on his Instagram and he was like, no, I don't have enough followers yet. So... Well, that's then, not what I said. I just said I don't really want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the target that you set? Ambitious? Oh, Andy I doesn't just, understand. I just, I'm trying to put a number out there where I don't have to do it. But broadly, I will start posting and, and like showing people what they like anything people want to see if I can get to it's an arbitrary oh maybe not anything people want to see uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I want to go so high that it's just, I want to go so high it's not going to happen 5,000 5,000 5, 5, 5, okay, that's, that's reasonable so if, if, if I can get to 5,000 followers on Instagram then that's it, it my life is over yeah <laughs> I think that's a really nice way to wrap it up. <laughs> Andy's life is over. Hey, you can document your marathon training. Well, there we go. Yeah. On yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Or I can just, you know, if no one cares and no one bothers following me, then I don't have to do anything yeah. at all. Well, then at least it reinforces what me and Rick have been saying for a while. Oh, true. <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose we better say thank you to you guys, our first ever live podcast audience. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to take some time before we finish this. I think all of us that were here, we want to thank you for doing this. Um, I think it, seeing your videos has, help, has helped us a lot, at least for me, and I can tell I, that for everyone. Um, I think it has made us want to keep on running. Also, I think uh, the fact that you're also showing the vulnerability of running has help us, has make us empathize and feel like, oh, we're not the only ones that are also struggling with this. So um, really, really, really want to thank that's you. Really nice. for oh, that's really nice. Thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs> that was an incredible way to, to end with a, a lovely message of support thank you for your support we, we're nothing unless people kind of watch and, and send us messages and, and do email into podcast at the running channel.com if you'd like to have your questions answered potentially not live but if you'd like us to go live again then maybe we should take it on a tour around the uk around the oh, world yeah. yeah how about um, we make this international Ooh. yeah so let's go to all the Ooh, major where do you want to go first oh, i don't want to go first Barry St. Edmunds. <laughs> I mean, when we said international, yeah, the, uh, I, 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 I was all, thinking somewhere a little bit warmer. No, well, I've always wanted to do the Honolulu Marathon. Let's leave it there. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>